Do you remember how it felt to be six years old? The world was full of possibilities. You were full of curiosity, alive, a natural learner, perhaps even convinced that you were a superhero. What if you were right? What if children are far more capable than we ever imagined? Education, student-teacher ratios, common core, standardized tests, control, regurgitation, oversight. 19th century solutions for the 21st century. Perhaps this makes sense to some until we ask, what if children really are far more capable than we ever imagined? Google shares information, Uber shares cars, Airbnb shares rooms. What if children could share learning with each other in a tightly bound community with high standards of excellence, becoming convinced that they could, know that they would find a deep burning need in their hearts that fit a deep burning need in the world? Welcome to my world as a middle school guide, the Acton Academy, a learner-driven community founded on the belief that every person who enters our doors, our young heroes, our guides and parents, deserves to find a calling that will change the world. For the next few minutes, I want to invite you on a journey, not to a utopia where learning and transformation are easy, because they're not, and they shouldn't be. Not to a place where a learner-driven community functions like a well-oiled machine, because human beings aren't built that way. But it is a place where magic does happen, because we serve heroes in the making. We'll explore the start of Acton Academy, more of an impulse than a vision. We'll look to what's worked well and what we learned from it, and what remains to be done. And then I promise a glimpse of what may be the first whisperings of a grand educational awakening. And in all of this, we'll save plenty of time for your questions. Our journey started six years ago when it came time to move our two boys, Charlie and Sam, from the Montessori school where they'd been going to a more traditional school. Our daughter was attending the very best private middle school in town, so I went to see the very best teacher at that school. And I asked him when we should move the boys. Immediately, without thinking, he said, right away. And I was a little puzzled, and I said, well, why? And he said, well, once they've had that kind of freedom, they will not take well to sitting at a desk for eight hours a day and having someone talk to them. At that moment, this is what flashed my head. And before I could think of anything, I said, I don't blame them. And this great teacher looked down at the floor for the longest time, and I thought it offended him. And then he looked up, and with tears in his eyes, he shook his head and quietly said, I don't blame them either. That day I went home to my wife, Laura, and I said, I don't know what we're gonna do. We're gonna homeschool, we're gonna start a school, I'll quit my job, but whatever we're doing, those two boys are not going to sit behind a desk for eight hours a day. And Acton Academy was born. But what were we going to build? We knew we weren't going to build a factory-like school. We knew they weren't going to sit at a desk and be talked at and lectured. So we began to think of something far simpler. And we look back to revolutionary times and the one-room schoolhouse. And back to earlier times and the idea of apprenticeships. And, you know, you, you think of this as being simple and perhaps simplistic, till you realize with those two things, before the invent of standardized tests and centralized schooling, America became the richest, most prosperous, and fairest nation on earth and helped inspire and create such heroes as Washington and Jefferson and Lincoln and Edison. 
We built the school on four simple questions. The first one, who am I and where am I going? The second, what tools and skills will I need and which will I master? The third, who will affirm me and hold me accountable? And finally, how do I prove what I can do? Now, these sound conceptual, so I'm gonna to try to give you, um, give you a sense of a metaphor, four metaphors that'll help frame these. The metaphors are Superman, Google, Alcoholics Anonymous, and the Boy Scouts. Hold those four in your mind for a moment. Let me unpack them. The first one, and the most powerful of anything we've done, who am I and where am I going? The idea that each child that enters our doors really is a genius. That it, we want to inspire and equip for a hero's journey to find a calling so they will change the world. Now, when I say genius, I don't mean 180 IQ. And by the way, if you look up the word in the dictionary, that's what it, not what it means either. We mean that they're going to have some very special talent that they can use and we can foster. If there's any one single powerful idea that's scalable, it's this idea that no one should be in a studio or around a child that doesn't believe that child is incredibly special and it's going to find a place in the world and it's going to matter. Number two, what skills do I need? Which skills should I master? Google, Google and gaming. Um, adaptive software, we're using things like Khan, Dreambox, Rosetta Stone, tools that make learning fun, that make it feel like a game. And then for the 21st century skills, quests. You feel like you're Sir Lancelot going after the Holy Grail, Harry Potter going after Lord Voldemort, or in this case, Thomas Edison in his Menlo Park lab creating electricity patents. Ways for students to collaborate and work together to learn those important 21st century skills. From Google and gaming to Alcoholics Anonymous, probably one of the greatest self-organizing forces in the country. Here, what we borrowed from AA are the idea of explicit covenants, promises between people in the studio. Our students draft these themselves, they sign them with a great ceremony, and they live by them. And it's why that they actually run their studios. And then finally, how do I prove what I can do? Whether it's badges that we've created that allow students to pour their own creativity into a fixed container that we can then take and morph into a traditional high school transcript, or they can create an electronic portfolio to sell themselves as an alternative schooler going to Stanford or Harvard or MIT, or perhaps skipping that all together to find a world-changing apprenticeship. So those are the four metaphors that frame what we do. Two important questions for us. What is the goal? Always asking what are we trying to do, but there's one question more important than that. Who's the customer? Because at Acton, we go out and every week we ask our parents and the children, how do we do this week? Scale of one to five, add your comments. Those questionnaires, those customer satisfaction surveys are open to the entire public. Sometimes they're pretty, sometimes they're not. But everyone knows where we stand all the time. We're always adapting. We had a lot of requests, actually, to tour the school um, from more traditional schools. And my comment is always, look, we really can't do that because the studios belong to the Eagles, but I'll find a way to get you in as soon as you put in a customer satisfaction survey. And I hear the same thing every time. Oh, we'd love to do that, but the faculty wouldn't let us. Oh, we'd love to do that, but the school board wouldn't. But if there's a second single very, our second very important point, it's the idea of actually asking the people that are in your studios that you're serving how you're doing and acting on that data. So the last piece about what we're doing, um, and one of the kind of things we figured out is that learning to know in the days of Google is not all that important. I mean, you need vocabulary, you need context to study biology, you need to understand how things work, but it's really not important if you get learning to do, learning to learn, learning to be right, students will vacuum up all the knowledge they need. So our school's built around learn to learn, learn to do, learn to be. In learning to learn, they're in Socratic dialogues, learning critical thinking skills. We're introducing processes that they can try. 
Uh, in this environment, in this one room schoolhouse, where we have 36 elementary school students in one room, 36 middle school students in another, 36 high school students in a third, the students are learning from each other. And in fact, the high schoolers are learning from the middle schoolers, the elementary schoolers from the high schoolers. There's a continual mix, most often with no adult in the room. Most often no adult at all. Learning to do hands-on projects in these quests with a requirement that at the end of the six-week session, there's a public exhibition. No grades, no homework, incredibly high standards is judged by the public and parents. And finally, the, probably the most important, learn to be. This idea that on a hero's journey, you're going to meet giants and ogres and challenges and have fellow travelers, and the whole idea is to go in search of something worthy of your gifts in a way that you'll be in flow, that you'll find yourself in great joy with a deep burning need in the world to solve. And then at the end of that voyage, finding the Holy Grail isn't the point. It's how the heroes changed in the process. And when you come to our studios and you see what happens when these learners promise each other to be held accountable, and you see them believing that they really are gonna change the world, the deep friendships and authentic relationships are probably one of the most important things we do. I will tell you that there's one thing I know these eagles will never do. They will never be going home to stay on their parents' couch after college. It's the one thing I'm not worried about at all. So here's where we are today. Here's the main campus um, just east of UT. We're, by the way, having a uh, kind of by invitation only uh, VIP tour tonight at 5 o'clock. The good news is you're all VIPs, so if anybody wants to come afterwards, come see me. I have uh, tickets if you would like to come see it, uh, see it for real. So a question comes up a lot of times, does it work? And I could show you the SAT-10 test data that shows our students are on average five grade levels above age in the middle school. Two-thirds of them actually placed out of high school. It's very limited data. Actually, there's not that many data points, uh, and students are coming and going, but they're clearly doing well. But that's not really what matters. You really need to see their portfolios and more than anything, listen to them talk and watch them interact together. I mean, it is an extraordinary group of young people. So what have we learned? Three key things. One, the hero's journey matters a lot. If you can get people believing that they are on this important individualized journey using their gifts to do something that matters, learning happens. Deep commitment happens. Skills are acquired. People, and if you believe that you have to do that in community, helping others as they help you, it's simply a transformational thing. And if, the second thing we've learned is that you focus on the tribe. And what I mean by this is, as autodidacts, some of us that love to learn, and most educators do, you assume everybody's going to love to learn. And one of my biggest takeaways is that's actually not true. Uh, most people may learn to love to learn, but most of them want to hang out with their friends. They want to have fun. So if you make the tribe a place where everybody has fun, with great ceremony to join, and then the, to be having fun in the tribe requires also work, suddenly everyone does love to learn. But it's because they want to be with their friends, not because of the learning itself. So you've got to make it fun first and challenging next. The third point is that the role of adults in our studio, certainly not as teachers, but our job's really to be game makers. We're to give challenges and processes and incentives to, to really get the game started, to invite you to play. And then our number one job is to very quickly inspire and equip our eagles, which is what we call them, our eagles themselves, to become the game makers. Uh, we can run one of these schools now with 120 students, uh, with we know no more than four adults. That includes everybody, by the way. Administrative, janitorial. Um, janitorial is easy because easy the students do it all. Uh, administrative is easy because they do most of it. Uh, we know we can run one of these schools because we're doing it now with four adults for about $4,000, $4,500 a year per student. We are confident we can run 120 students with two adults. We are aspiring to be able to run 120 students with one adult. If we do that, the cost drops to somewhere around $2,000 per student per year. 
If you add in the apprenticeship income, so say a family is going to keep that income and offset tuition with it, the cost begins to approach zero. Will we get that low? I don't know. But I will tell you that the students actually do a much better job of working with each other and learning from each other and running the classroom than any adult. And our rule is the more adults in the room, the more things are going to go wrong. Last slide. Um, this is not perfect by a long shot. It is always a work in progress. We're always learning. Three really big challenges. One, we just launched our launch pad, our, our high school, which the students call launch pad. Um, and we turned them loose too quickly. Uh, we, we, we basically let them create their own learning plans from scratch. About half of them did amazing things. The other half were too lost. So we've got to go back in and layer in some project management and some more step-by-step -step work on finding your calling as a high schooler. And we're rebuilding that now. But it's something we're going to have to rebuild. We, um, we didn't make the path clear enough for the high schoolers to be able to build their own learning. What they are doing now that's interesting, though, is they are creating almost all the curriculum for the middle school and elementary school. The high schoolers can create better quests than we can using the resources on the internet and the things they've learned. Second current challenge, guides. Here's our challenge. We've got to equip guides and find them. And so far, we found that we have not done a good job or been able to convert um, very many of any traditional teachers. We've got to get them handing off processes quickly to the Eagles so the students run more and more of the program. And then we've got to commission them to go out and start their own schools. Because think about it, our school is going to start with a few adults, grow to four or five, and then diminish to one or two. If you're a guide, that doesn't sound like a great career path unless you're going to roll out and start one of these schools. And so the last challenge is really what we're feeling like being swept up into what we think may be a great educational awakening. But I'll, I'll save that one for last. I'd like to pause now for your questions, suggestions, and comments. Hi. Um, Hi. I, I feel like the heavens have parted on stage, and you have come down to. If the heavens had parted on stage, I would not be here. I can promise <laughs> you that. Um, I think it's really interesting and and effective. It makes so much sense to have the students drive everything. But I was wondering if you could speak about in in what manner and to what degree you are instilling these frameworks. You said, for example, that that your high school kids didn't have enough. Uh, framework and structure, do you then come in and, and take over and say, okay, everyone forget what you did. We're going to do it my way now. How, what is the process that you can come back in and change that? That's the single best question I've been asking a long time. It's a great question. And, and the words instill and come back in are exactly my nature. I'm a left brain engineer and I want order and I want to come back in. After 25 years of being a Socratic teacher, I've learned that that impulse is exactly the wrong impulse. It's my impulse, and I still have to resist it. So when there's a little bit of chaos and things begin to break down, you have to step back. And then it gets worse. And then you know what you have to do? You have to step back again and pause. And you have to trust that the leaders in the studio will get tired of that fairly quickly, and they do, and they will call a halt to the chaos and begin to reorganize it. Now, here's why it's not totally free for them. Do you just give them a blank sheet of paper and expect them to you know, create democracy or a democratic republic or a bicameral legislature? I mean, that's pretty hard to do from scratch. So our job is to say, here's two things you might consider, having the executive branch and a judicial branch. Uh, then they will go, hmm, I'm not sure what that is, but we'll go look it up and we'll be back. But if you offer them choices, particularly of processes, um, different example, I need to come up with some new ideas. Well, you mean brainstorming? Well, you could do mind mapping, or you could do this technique with post-it notes, or you may be able to go out and find, if you Google that, find a third process that's even cooler and bring it back. So our job is really to offer those processes. If you're willing to stand back and continue to offer them processes, they'll figure it out. And what happens is they come back stronger the next time. And then believe me, it all falls apart again. It all falls apart. And then it gets stronger again. And it, when we talked to the Eagles at the end of last year, the middle schoolers, and said, um, we had 37 different processes that we could remember that they'd been introduced to, the Socratic method, setting SMART goals. I mean, they manage all their own goals in a day. And we said, what are the two most important? And so we had a Socratic discussion, almost a unanimous agreement 
The two were self-management, time management, and goal setting, number one. Number two, self-governance. Everyone agreed those were the most valuable, middle schoolers. So you think about it in life, if you do those two things well, and you're honest and you show up on time and work hard, everything else works. So they've taught us that, but the trick is, it's not complete chaos, you have to allow the chaos to occur and offer the leaders choices that they can take back to the group and they can learn and get better in practice. That makes a lot of sense. So in your, in your Launchpad example, you're stepping back and the leaders, the, the Eagles, are sorting it out for themselves. Well, they are, in here, but here's where we didn't give them, there's no process, so here's, maybe you can answer this because I'm befuddled by it. It's one thing to have you know, a series of quests we're all going through together and you can opt in and out of it. It's another thing to have 10 simultaneous quests being planned and executed by launch patterns to then take back into the middle school. Now I've got 10 quests and guides aren't supposed to have any part in it. That turns out to be too much cognitive load to put on to figure all that out. We didn't offer them a good process. One of the reasons is I don't know the process. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna bring in 10 uh, either parents and or leaders from the community and the Eagles get to pick a guide. We're gonna sit down with the adults and try to think through project management and how we do this. And in doing that, we'll build the kit and the processes that will become what they'll use. So we're kind of befuddled, they're befuddled. We're gonna bring in some really, we've got some great parents and bring them in and just sit down and figure it out. And we will have a process now where we can manage 10 simultaneous quests being created. Probably something on Basecamp. It'll be some sort of project management software. I just don't know how to do it. That makes so much sense. Thank you. So Thank much. you. Hello. Um, I was, I'm a non-traditional teacher in a traditional school right now. Um, I'm wondering, you. where do you get your eagles from for the uh, past, for, from when the school started? And then also, do you think the launch pad was because where the eagles came from before? Like, have they been middle schoolers into the high school program, or were they brand new high schoolers? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so we started with seven students. And so we started, you know, really small in this little house. And those were our two boys and a couple of families crazy enough to join us. And we started with a Montessori teacher, so she had some credibility and attracted a few students. And then we grew, and um, I will tell you about elementary school, kids are easy. We can take almost any kid in elementary school. Parents are really hard. <laughs> Kids are easy, parents are hard. Middle school, kids are still pretty easy, but they've been in a, you know, but, but they're a little harder. Parents are still hard. Uh, and Launchpad, you know, our kids are so far ahead, it's hard to take almost anybody straight into that. So mainly middle class, upper middle class students, that's just who we happen to attract. Um, and, you know, and about 85% of them make it, of the ones that sign up. But we, you know, we struggled and fought for every student early uh, now we have three spots open in the elementary school and 100 applications pending. Um, so once it catches on, you know, it, your problem goes from scarcity to abundance and how do you manage that? Thank you. You bet. Hello. I'm really curious about um, this notion of students teaching themselves yeah. how to learn, so learning how to learn, because um, I'm a student at university and I think I definitely need this direction. So I go to a school called Minerva and, and they're really teaching us how to learn and they're directing us um, and learning how to think before what to think. Um, so I guess I'm curious about what is the role of the institution and um, where do you see these students going? Do you think, like what will happen once they graduate from, from Acton Academy? So really two, two questions if I hear it right. One, kind of how do they learn how to learn and then the second one um, about where they're gonna go. The first one is actually pretty easy. If, if you'll give them something they wanna have at the end that's exciting to do and perform and some processes, and manage the incentive somewhat between extrinsic and intrinsic, they'll, they'll make the learning happen. And I'll give you an example. Um, we have not taught one minute of math in six years, zero. And our kids are moving about two grade levels every year through Khan Academy, which I think is far more rigorous than any of the math I ever took. Uh, so one day I was looking at the Khan analytics never having taught anything in the middle school. And I noticed that the learning per minute, number of skills per minute was going up and the number of videos per minute was going down. I thought, well, that's curious. They're using less of them. How in the world does that work? So I called a group of them together. I had no idea. I said, what are you guys doing? What, how does this work? And they said, oh, oh, oh. Well, you know, if we know how to solve the problem, we just solve it and we move on. We kind of earn another level. If we don't, we, they didn't say backwardly engineer, but they basically looked at the answer and figured out how it worked and backwardly engineered and solved it. That's the easiest thing. So, but you know, if we didn't do that, we had to watch the videos. 
And I'm sorry because Sal's going to be here a little later, but they said, you know, some of Sal Khan's videos are really boring. <laughs> so we went out on the internet and we found better videos, each of us did, for certain subjects, and then we shared them. And then if we get really stuck, we each watch a different video and get together and teach each other. So there's an example of, you know, they've got a problem, they need to solve it, they go out and find other resources, they bring them in in discussion. Uh, another quick one would be writing. Uh, we, we give very little talk at all about writing. They have very clear rubrics for critiques. They write a lot. They love to critique each other's work. They love to give critiques. Because they love critiques, they love to write a lot. They write a lot, they give a lot of critiques, they write a lot. I think they write, middle school wrote 100 pages last year. It's a lot of writing. They're getting to be really good writers. Grammar, yeah, it came later. Grammar wasn't very good early. Thoughts were good, grammar wasn't. Format didn't look very good. Guess what, nobody likes to have bad grammar or format. So now they have uh, no red ink and they've got grammar checkers and they check each other's grammar and their grammar is getting much, much better. Same thing with form. So it's just an idea if you've kind of got this view of excellence and some processes, they'll figure it out. No one wants to not be good at something. Oh, and I'm sorry, the second yeah. one, I would say the second one's about when you get as old as I am, you forget things. So the second one, uh, where are they gonna go? We don't know. College is being disintermediated so quickly. I get a knock occasionally for being anti-college. I'm not anti-college. If you get a free ride to MIT, you ought to go. Should you pay $300,000 to go to you know, third tier U? Probably not. And so my guess is most of our launch patterns will earn two years of college credits while in high school. And maybe they go to Palo Alto for two years after that. I think all of them will get, or most of them will get a college degree. How they get those, you know, it's gonna be interesting. And a number of them are already very talented in certain apprenticeships. So I don't know. You know. Now you can go on edX and for 25 bucks, you can get a certified, verified, graded MIT freshman engineering course. And some of our students are taking those. As an employer, you bring me 20 of those with MIT stamped on it. I'm not sure I really care that you have an MIT degree. So I don't know where all that's gonna go. And we're telling parents, we're not getting in the middle of that battle. We'll have them prepared where they have the option Great transcript, portfolio, college, apprenticeship, and then the parents are going to have to fight that out with them, not us. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Hi there. I work Hi. for uh, Kip Houston. Uh, our, our schools target low-income neighborhoods. I'm a big fan of Kip. Thank you. Um, and then maybe you know the KIPP model is very traditional type teaching. Yep. Uh, my specific school, we've, we've gone one-to-one. -one. Um, we're, we're, I'm pushing a lot of self-efficacy at my school with my students. Uh, we use Khan Academy. We, we use No Red Ink. Um, and your ideas are, quite frankly, transformative. I can't wait to see the school. My question is, for my, my students, my neighbors, I live across the street from where I work. They're my, my kids. I call them the eagles. I call them my babies. What, uh, what suggestions, ideas do you have for our communities and for, for those educators who are on the edge of innovation and, and pushing for the next level of self-efficacy with our kids? I, well, first off, absolutely, I respect what you do and I have absolutely no advice because I couldn't, I haven't done what you've done. I'm a big fan of KIPP and I know all about KIPP and spent a lot of time in KIPP schools and it's a terrific model. I don't know the answer of what we do that would work inside of KIPP, although you do a lot of things in terms of visioning. And I mean, I think the one thing that is gonna to have to talk, change about KIPP, and I talked to Mike Feinberg about this, is the idea that college is the end all be all. It was when KIPP started, it's not now. So that's gonna to have to change, but a lot of what KIPP does is great. We get asked all the time, how will this work in the inner city? My belief, knowing people that teach in the inner city is that it will work terrifically if the standards, if the, if the Eagles are allowed to vote people off the island don't want to be there. Uh, but I've never taught in the inner city. Until I have, I'm not gonna have a real opinion on it, it's not fair. So I just, I just don't know is the honest answer. Um, but I have great hope. And, and we actually have some more inner city experiments with acting going on, including a, someone at KIPP who started a large number of KIPP schools is helping build an acting academy for, for his children in another town. So we're gonna see lots of cross-pollinization and probably learn a lot. Thank you for your honesty. Thank you mind you. telling me what Feinberg said about college? Uh, no, I, I, I don't remember I would, but no, no. I just, I just made the point to him because I'm a big fan, but I made the point, you know, it, you gotta be careful 
with anybody saying these days, it's all about college, you have to go to college. I think you do need a college degree, I'm not disputing that, but I think we need to talk about why you want to learn. It's like our four questions that we started with. They're not really the kind of questions you would see in a school, but they're the questions anybody ought to ask about their life. And I just think college is changing so fast, we have to be careful about making it the end all be all. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, um, I have two questions. You mentioned um, authentic relationships, and I was wondering, how do you build a culture of that in uh, your school? And uh, the second question is, um, you also mentioned the culture of, uh, that's fun and that's challenging. And I was wondering, um, how do you keep the kids from taking themselves too seriously with what they're learning, or, hasn't, or has this not been a problem at all? I'm laughing because I know Alejo really well. So I did not plant these questions. But um, so, so the first question was, how do you establish this culture you know, of kind of fun to rigor? I think you really do make it about each of them doing a bunch of team building exercises, not much more than that, understanding that they each have different gifts and that they're each cool and fun to be with. So that's part of it. Um, then that this tribe is really headed somewhere important. That's a second piece that's important. That they're all making very strong commitments and then there becomes a time when you need some teeth behind those commitments and they need to step up and enforce those and that gets to be a little tough. So all of the tribe building can take place in about four weeks, but it involves great ceremony around commitments that are taken seriously and then enforced um, with, you know, with a sense of um, we're all going somewhere important and each one of us are, are cool. One thing that helps is in a multi-age classroom, I mean, think about this, I've got 36 to 40 elementary schoolers we don't think in grades, but what is that? It's five or six grades. That's eight kids per grade. Some of them are tall, some of them are short, some of them are fast, some of them are good at math, some of them are good at writing. You can't keep track of who's good at what. So all of a sudden, it, it is comp competition. You want to kind of win, but it's too confusing to, feed, to, to pigeonhole people. So that tribe size works really well to keep everything mixed up. And, and in the last piece, you're going to ask about excellence and then you know, the ones that are kind of get too serious. So our excellence standards are not about grades. Everything is challenged by choice. You, you, you can do something for a badge or not. Now, you do have to earn a certain number of badges to get out of elementary school and middle school. We tell people you can stay in here until you're 35. Fine with us. Your parents will have to talk to you about that, but we don't, talk, we don't care how fast you move. You move six months slower or faster. It doesn't matter. Excellence is interesting, though, because here's the standard for excellence. If it's the first time you've done something, it's got to be your best effort, and your peers will sign off on that. Second time, it has to be better than the first time. And that continues, it just has to improve until you get to be so good, it's hard to improve every time. And then the question becomes, have you compared yourself to a world-class writer, to Hemingway if it's writing? Then if you've won a studio competition or had an exhibit, uh, an exhibition, you've been approved for that, or you're in a public exhibition, that's automatically approved. So the standard of excellence is based on not you comparing yourself to someone, but the idea of grit and growth and, and working really hard. Last question, half the kids are wound too tight, half are wound too loose. You gotta loosen up the ones that are so anal retentive, I would have been one of these, and you don't wanna get everything perfect. By the way, most of that comes from the parents, including whatever I've done to my kids. Um, you know, the ones that too loose have been rescued all the time. I mean, you can, when you get to know the parents well, it's not, I've made more parenting mistakes than anybody alive, and I tell my kids, you know, you're gonna be in therapy, so let's just, you know, let's accept that. <laughs> And it's, I don't know what I did, but I accept it. So I'm not criticizing parents. I'm just saying as parents, we're all on our own hero's journey, and we have to really be thoughtful about how our journey plays into theirs. And half of them are too tight, half of them are too loose. Mix them together with the right thoughtfulness and conflict resolution. Everybody gets better. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Hello. Um, I uh, want to start off by applauding you for having the school that I dreamed of having when I was in fifth grade. Thanks. And I, <laughs> I'm serious. I actually work for my wife, and she runs the school, so that, that uh, but, but thank you. <laughs> um, having said that, I'm going to devil's advocate you on two, Perfect. two uh, points. One is I grew up uh, to go seek out the college that was the closest thing to this dream school that I wanted, and I went to that college and paid a lot of money to get to educate myself. And so my devil's advocate question there is, what are we paying you for? Um, because in the end, that was what I started, I came away from that college saying, you know, why did I pay so much money 
to do all this for myself. So is the question, so. why are they paying us? Or, yes. Or, yeah. yeah. No. 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 And I think and that, I, no. I, I'm glad that you talked about lowering the cost because I. I mean, but that's a point. No. And I. And I think that's why. I think that's why it's a. It's a great question because if you teach yourself, the cost goes way down. And and to be clear here, because this is going to be misunderstood. Some people say, "Well, you mean they have no teachers?" And I said, "No. Our teacher-student ratio is 20 to one, and I mean 20 teachers for every student. Everybody on the internet that's an expert, anyone in the community they can learn from, any coach. I mean, so." They've got enormous numbers of mentors and teachers, so they're really well taught. But they seek those out and hire them, you know, and often paying them in appreciation or if it's on the internet for free. Um, so, so I agree with you that if we can make these communities function the right way, um, they shouldn't pay much. Now, I will say it's a dilemma, though. We charge $10,000 a year. We made that number up. Most of our families are so excited they're not paying 25 at St. Stephen's. I mean, 10 to them is the biggest bargain. That's not in the inner city, obviously. It's not for people who can't afford it. Um, so this whole question of how pricing is going to work, um, that's why we hope to have a lot of actins and let the market work it out. But, but I agree with you. If you're educating yourself, you shouldn't pay somebody else. So maybe you're just paying for a Starbucks to come to in high school, in our case, and that would be just fine with me. Well, thank you. Um, Follow-up question, just because uh, we're... In public education, we have, to, you may have heard the metaphor, we have to take all the blueberries. Right. Um, how would you, have you dealt with uh, children with extreme special needs of any cart, and how do you imagine that working, taking yeah. this to scale? So, great question. Um, I, we have, not, there are clearly students that we can't serve. Now, some of the other actions that have popped up are serving students with more special needs than we are, but there are students. I will say from at least the population we're getting, ADD and ADHD, there's a real easy solution to that. You let them run around whenever they want to, and that just that problem seems to really diminish. Um, there are certainly learning disabilities we can't serve, but it's surprising how many students we can serve. So I think we'll see micro communities that serve you know, different pockets. Um, I don't think there are a lot of blueberries out there, though. I mean, that's my, my take is there are kids, and we've got some of them that aren't ready yet, and when they're not ready, they get sent home. I mean, by the way, our students run all disciplines. So if you get enough strikes and they have this Eagle Buck system and you run out of Eagle Bucks and you get all these chances, after three real strikes, you're sent home for a day. The third day you go home, you don't come back. You're done. Students run all that. The only thing guides have uh, power through our contract with is that there must be due process. As long as you practice due process, you're in charge of who's in the community. Uh, getting sent home is a pretty big wake-up call, and it doesn't solve everyone. So we've had a few that hadn't made it, but I don't think there are nearly as many blueberries out there as we think. Thank you. My first question is, have you heard about the Institute of Play and yes. their concept of missions? It yes. sounds a lot like their, your quests. We've borrowed from anybody we can find. So yes, we've <laughs> stolen lots of good things from the quest schools and the Institute of Play. Okay, the second one, yes, was what you were just touching on was discipline and how does that work? Could you go a little bit more in depth on that? Well, I mean, the, the, the students are in charge of, they have, a, they have a, a behavioral contract that says what you know, you're allowed to do and not to do. And I'll give you an example. Um, it, it's usually two things. You can't disturb me, I can protect my privacy. So if I'm in flow and working and you walk up and bounce a ball in front of me, that's an eagle buck. So you gotta pay this piece of currency for, for doing that. Uh, the second one is you're disrespecting the rules for the studio. You're roughhousing in the studio when, as a community, we've decided not to do that. That's an eagle buck. Eagle bucks aren't that serious unless you're not earning enough points, either doing work or serving in the community, and then suddenly you're in negative points, and that's a, that's a sign you need to do something. So we also have 360 surveys every six weeks. They're anonymous. You don't know who said what, and no one else knows your comments or your rating, but you know them and then you know everyone else's ratings. You don't know the name to them, you just know where you fall. And those tend to be remarkably good about people will see what their classmates really think about them and they tend to change their behaviors because it's not nice, to, it doesn't feel good. So it's not perfect. I mean, we still have problems all the time. The systems help the Eagles work it out, but all the discipline, 100% is handled by the students. And just to give you a sense, uh, as a guide, I am not allowed to even offer, utter a declarative sentence in the studio. I can only ask questions. So I have no authority beyond the contract. The contract only allows me to intervene for health and safety. If you're gonna do a header off the second floor, I can stop that. Uh, if you're just gonna break an arm, I probably won't stop you, actually. I mean, we, we have a lot of broken bones, and we'll let that go. But if you're gonna severely injure yourself, I'll stop you, or I can show you the contract you signed and point out the behavior 
and say you must either change your standards or change your behavior. So either get, lower the contract to match the behavior or raise the behavior. That's the only thing I can do. That led last year to the guides uh, walking out in protest because we did that once and they didn't do anything. So we said, you violated the contract, we're gonna leave. We left. We were gone for five days, there was no adult. We came back and the school was running perfectly and no one wanted us back. <laughs> True story. So we had to kind of bargain our way back in that we didn't think they could build Quest quite well enough without us. We managed to convince a majority that in fact we were still needed to help them. But there are many days that go by now that there's no adult in the room all day. Just nobody, there's, and, and, and they run everything. Uh, we have cameras where we can actually see everything that goes on, not for surveillance because the Eagles use them on tape to, to watch themselves and to work on speeches and things. But um, there are many days we don't even go in. Thank you. And how immediate is that feedback then? You talked about 360 degree evaluations every couple of That's what every six weeks, but the, the feedback, if you break a rule in the studio, you'll be asked for an eagle buck politely within about a nanosecond. It's often, you know, it's, it's friendly, but if you, if you bug me, I'm gonna ask you for an eagle buck. Thank you. And what happens with those eagle bucks? Do they go into a pot or like back into the bank or do they go to the other person? <laughs> they go back in the bank, but we, we had a problem that certain students were never you know, getting asked for any, they were earning a lot, and uh, so we had eagle buck inflation. So we, we had to actually, occasionally we'll let them kind of buy something they want to go do, buy something for the studio. It can't be for yourself, but for the studio, or take the studio on a trip or an ice cream party. And so we said we were going to lower uh, eagle buck inflation, and one of the 10-year-olds uh, said, aren't you afraid that draining that much liquidity from the system will cause a depression? <laughs> I don't know where that came from. So I want to finish with this, uh, and it's the point about the whispers of, of a great awakening and what, what we're seeing. Um, and by the way, I want to say again, we didn't expect to start a middle school and a high school. We were doing something for our kids that started growing. We certainly never expected to start more than one Acton Academy. So here's where we started in Austin. About two years after we started, a dear friend and former student of mine in Guatemala said, I want one of these for my kids. Can I start one? So we handed him just a stack of stuff. I mean, it wasn't even, probably most of it legible, and said, sure. And we found as we both grew together, we learned more from him than he did from us. And he's an exceptionally gifted entrepreneur and a, and a heck of a human being. He and his wife have done an amazing job. And then we had a family that the husband got an incredible job offer in California, couldn't turn it down, except the wife said, we're not moving unless we start an acting academy. I don't care how good the offer is. Uh, by the way, a quick story as all this is going on, um, we're about two years into the school. I get a call from a woman named uh, Heather Staker. Many of you may know Heather. She's Clay Christensen's right-hand person for education. And Clay was a friend of mine from Harvard Business School. You know, great guy. He's, of course, the father of disruption. And she said, you know, I'm going to put Acton Academy as one of the top 40 blended schools. So, wow, that's cool. I mean, we don't know what we're doing. That's wonderful. And then she called back a few months later and said, I've studied this more. I'm going to name you the number one blended school. Like, well, that can't even be true. I mean, we're true, because we're, I mean, believe me, it's all messed up at this point. We're trying to figure it out. So we're very grateful. And she calls back about a month later and said, do you mind if my husband and I come to see the school? I said, well, sure, come on. First trip they'd ever come to, Texas. Turns out they both live in Honolulu. He's a high executive, one of the top executives of Hawaiian Airlines, both Harvard Business School graduates. Fly to Austin for the day, show them around the school. Um, applications are kind of coming in, so we're busy. We get an email from the Dallas-Fort Worth Airport as they're changing planes to go to Honolulu. It said, we've decided to move our family to Austin if you'll accept our children. Read five books, required an application on the plane to Honolulu, FedEx us back, beautiful applications. Three weeks later, the stakers were in Austin. So it's the acts of our friends in Guatemala, our family in California, Heather having kind of the courage uh, to do that and the belief in it. And then suddenly, we got some more requests. So now, as of September 2014, we had eight Actons. And some of the own new owners are in the room today. And by September 2015, we expect 25. We are now getting one application to open a school every day. No PR. No advertising. I don't go to conferences. I'm in the studio all day. I'm a middle school guide. But somewhere, um, 
word is spreading, not just that what we're doing is cool, it's not that. It's that people are hungry for something different. And I mean, I got an application this morning from Barcelona. The guy knew all about the school. I have no idea how. Uh, we have no staff. We have no one helping us do this. But these applications just keep coming in and we're providing kits for people who are, who are starting these. So as I, as I end, I, wanna, I was trying to think of an eagle to give you as an example, and I had three to choose from. One was this incredible 14-year-old woman who came to us at 12 and was told that she was just couldn't learn, just couldn't do it. She was at the second or third grade level in math and um, not much better in writing. And um, so she joined. And two years later, she had gained nine grade levels in math. Now, to tell you the truth, she's not the world's best mathematician. Uh, but she worked so hard that she overcame everything. Same thing with her writing. I was going to use her as an example because she wrote us a tearful letter because she left the school last week. And she's going to have to be gone for a while. Because she's the number two ranked 18-year-old at 14 years old a volleyball player. And she's getting ready for the Olympics. So she has to take a break to go, to go for the Olympics. And I wish I could read the letter to you. It makes me cry every time. It's just a beautiful letter. I could have, I could have had her. There's also another woman from Guatemala, from our Guatemala school, uh, who at 15, uh, I could tell you all sorts of amazing things. Right? 15 was uh, the youngest ever picked for Peter Thiel's 20 under 20, uh, most amazing young people in the world. Uh, last I heard, she was negotiating with uh, two venture capitalists in, um, in Silicon Valley to fund a new website idea of hers. But I decided on a third one to share with you, and I had to, hard to pick between the three. But first, I want to show you a little video clip of something that's happening alongside Actons that's, that's connected, uh, really fun, called the Children's Business Fair, and it's children kind of starting their own businesses. In this, you'll see almost all these students are Acton Academy students. And as you listen to them, see if you can spot the person I'm going to highlight in just a moment as I close. I'm here to talk to you about the physics fair. As you can see, we have lots of tent stuff, and that's for a booth. It has lots of stuff in it that people can buy. Today I am selling Polaroid photos that I take with my new Polaroid camera. Today I'm at my business called Foreign Fortunes, and I'm doing card tricks for a dollar. My product is candy sushi. Inside each roll is uh, which is made of Rice crispy is two Twizzlers for imitation crab and cucumber. Action Children's Business Fair is a fun fair where a bunch of kids can come and be an entrepreneur for a day and learn how to uh, make profit. I've probably made a little bit like 125 $250. Last year it was around $300, so hopefully this year it will be around $400. If I sell out, I'll earn $3,700 interesting experience because adults start to treat you like adults because it's, you know, it's their money they're talking about. They want something good that they can invest in. Life Paleo cookies are different from any other cookie because they're processed sugar-free, only natural sweeteners, and they're gluten-free and dairy-free and high in protein. Cupcakes and the cookies are made with gluten-free ingredients and we try to keep it as natural as possible. I wanted to do something that showcased my art talents and I think this business has a bigger target audience because everyone writes stationery. If you don't challenge, you won't struggle. And if you don't struggle, you won't know, learn the basics well, of learning. I want to grow up to either be a businessman or an architect. I might consider being an entrepreneur. It's really fun here today, and I bet it'll be fun later when I have a really more serious business. When I'm older, I'm not sure I want to be yet, but I want to be happy. <laughs> see if you spotted uh, spotted my last character. Before I do that, just to invite you, I have, this is a wonderful book, and I have a number of copies of it every once in a Unschooling Rules by Clark Aldridge, who's helped us a lot at, um, at Acton, and it's a terrific read if um, it really changed the way you think about education. Also, just a little handout if you want to know more about Acton. And then finally, if you want that VIP ticket, I have a handful of these up here. If you want to come to the school at 5 o'clock today, it's only about 10 minutes from here. Uh, you will not hear anything from adults. Uh, the Eagles will lead a discussion, kind of show you around uh, the place. They have not been prepped. 
they have no, I mean, they're just showing up, you're showing up, and at some point, I'd say if we start at five at about, you know, 5.30, they'll take the stage and you can ask them questions and see for yourself. So if you want one of these tickets, please see me. So to close, um, this is a young woman, uh, one of the young people in the video. She told you, I think she made, what did she say in the video, $2,600 or something like that. Well, actually, she covered all of her inventory costs and made $2,600. What she didn't tell you is she signed two retail contracts at the fair, and I think her card business is going to net, not gross, but net something like $30,000 this year. Um, however, that's just a sideline for her. She actually loves fashion design, and so in one of her apprenticeships, she got a high-end fashion design apprenticeship solely by sending an email, because it was such a good email, to a high-dollar fashion designer in Colorado, and she went up there for a week and worked. She was so good that she was called to New York for another apprenticeship, where her work was, I mean, it's exceptional work, and she was noticed by someone, and they said, would you mind meeting with this woman who's really interested in you? And so she spent two hours, and this woman talked to her about life and what she should do with her life and her talent. And then when she got out, she Googled Donna Karen to see who it was. Reese is 12 years old. So I want to leave you with this. Next time you come across a young person, someone who reminds you of yourself when you were five or six or 10 years old, don't dismiss their superhero dreams. Instead, tell them you believe that they are a hero on a hero's journey who deserves to find a calling. Who knows, those simple words of encouragement and affirmation just might change a life. And that life just might change the world. Thank you.